Yo, bros, we're back with the Catholic Masculinity Show, and I got my three hosts, uh, Dr. Michael Robillard, we got Timothy Gordon, and we got Will Noland, Nolan Knows. And so we got some pretty awesome dudes here on our panel, real smart guys, dudes that you're going to want to sit around and pick their brain on various topics of philosophy and life. And so today we are continuing our weekly series and we're going to be speaking about courtship or biblical courtship versus modern dating. And so there is a distinction. Uh, modern dating is a newfangled creation. Uh, I, I think I believe it started when the automobile became popular. And this is when uh, young men and young women could leave the court <laughs> to go and do whatever they want outside of the protection of the parents. And so we kind of think in terms of uh, the way we, we go about dating these days as something at, like it should, like it's always been this way. But it's a new thing. It's a byproduct of sexual revolution, feminism, and uh, the, the, the seeking of pleasure or effeminate nature being stimulated in men. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what courtship looked like before the advent of modern dating, as well as what it might look like if we began practicing it or honoring it or utilizing it as fathers or uh, expecting it as fathers in our homes with our children. So real quick, before we get started with that, just want to do a quick shout out. Dr. Michael, how you doing, brother? Not bad. How are you, Elliot? Cool, man. So you're down in Miami t this weekend with your family? Yep. Yeah. Visiting the uh, sister and her husband and uh, our uh, my soon to be nephew uh, coming on the way. So yeah, visiting them for the holidays and uh, yeah, it's great down here. Cool. Timothy, what are you doing for the preparation of the reception of our Lord on Christmas Day? Well, that's appropriate because it's Christmas <laughs> Eve Eve. In my household with seven kids, we, we start counting down the double and triple and quadruple derivative eves of Christmas Eve. We're like uh, 10 out because my kids are so excited. So we're, we're on Christmas Eve Eve and the kids are, are about bursting with excitement. We go to Christmas Eve Mass and then um, yeah, pretty much the standard open a present or sometimes two on Christmas Eve always do a special dinner on Christmas Eve. We're getting guests uh, on Christmas at lunch after the, uh, in the post-present lull, we're getting dear friends as guests. So we're looking forward to that. Again, God bless you all, by the way, on uh, yes. Christmas Eve. That's right. Will, I have a question for you, buddy. So um, I've learned recently that in traditional uh, celebration of Christmas, we didn't put up our lights and we didn't put up our trees and we didn't decorate until after Christmas. How, what does your house look like right now? Like, are you, are you blasting the lights right now? Or are you waiting for the light of the Lord to come in to turn them on? <laughs> uh, my kids went and bought some lights a week ago or so. So we've got lights everywhere outdoors as well. So we're not sticking to that tradition. I couldn't hold them back. And then they're, they're excited for a midnight mass. And then we're going to see my parents and some relatives as well. So we get into the Christmas spirit. That's right. Yeah, we, <laughs> we've been putting up Christmas lights since Thanksgiving. That's generally what we've been doing. And then take them down on Christmas. Apparently, that's the opposite way that it's supposed to be done. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. So let's open up with this, guys. Uh, I have three daughters. I'm a mentor to millions of young men worldwide. And so the conversation about dating obviously is, it comes up and it's important to me. How do I prepare my daughters for going out there into the world and finding a husband? And how do I answer questions in a dignified way when young men are asking me things uh, that come from the masculine mindset, right? Uh, I found myself in a, in a unique situation where uh, I get to really be a mediator between both. I want to see what's best for women because, well, I have three daughters. I love women. I'm married. Um, so, I, you know, I can't go with the whole bro position on things. 
But then I'm also sought out by young men to be given honest ideas and information about how to go about dating. And so I came to uh, understanding and, and learning about courtship biblical courtship and I have a couple of resources I just want to share here real quick not that we're going to unpack these but where I learned a lot of what I uh, know and what we're going to talk about come from well number one there's a great video on YouTube by Father Ripperger called Four Stages of Courtship that teach you about those four stages but then also I found these girls uh, they're called the Botkin Sisters and they've got a bunch of they're Protestant but they've got a bunch of resources uh on how to prepare young ladies for being wives. And so there's this one DVD, it's really cool. I right? had to get it on eBay because they don't have DVDs anymore. Um, but it's called Return of the Daughters. And it's about how young women uh, are best served by staying home with their fathers, being under the authority of their father until they're passed over to the authority of their husband. This sort of intermediary independence uh, that our culture takes for granted, doesn't really exist. It's, it's not, it's not um, consistent with biblical courtship. Then also, So Much More is a great book uh, that is written for women about seeing themselves as so much more, right? You know, so much more than the culture lays out for them. There's, there's a lot more than, um, than the plan that's, you know, go to college and, and uh, join a sorority and ride the cock carousel and then, be on birth control pills until your eggs are about to rot and then hit the wall and have the epiphany and then go chasing beta males who you wouldn't have paid attention to beforehand. Uh, but now because you need somebody to settle down with you pay attention to guys that you wouldn't have looked at before. Anyway, that's a general, that's a general way things go about so much more. And this is a book that I'm doing a book study with my daughters. It's called, uh, it's not that complicated how to relate to guys in a healthy, sane and biblical way. So there's a lot of resources out there. Just like, as I started doing research, I discovered, but I would love to hear from my bros what you guys think uh, and how you would answer this question. What are the differences? What are some of the main differences between biblical courtship as you know it and modern dating? And so I'll let you guys pick up that ball, whoever wants to run with it first. Well, I want to just kick off by saying that Christ condemned even just a man's looking at a woman with lust. So we've come so far from that, that most guys would now see that as some kind of joke. Like what, even if I just look at a woman lustfully, that's wrong. But if we're going back to what the biblical model of masculinity is, then that's where we have to get back to. And whereas we used to get boys being slightly shy, naturally in their first encounters with girls and not only that but also teased a bit like for a boy to be making moves towards having a girlfriend his friends would tease him now that seems to have gone almost totally so the idea is that the faster you can move the better the more of an impressive boy you are and the more you lust after them the better so the cultural standards have shifted but that doesn't mean that they're right. Agree. And I would just say, uh, I'll open up by saying, I don't think, however controversial, this might be received, uh, especially coming out of the mouth of the guy who wrote The Case for Patriarchy. I think it's a distinction of degree between modern dating and modern courtship. And it's a wide it's a wide distinction it's an easy distinction of degree to to parse out because there's so much space in between true courtship and what we have today but i don't think it's a distinction of kind and i'd say that the i mean they're not two totally different species of thing the way uh a lot of your typical readers of uh my book case for patriarchy who are willing and enthusiastic to hear my message would have it and here's why courtship is all about con the control maintained by, I guess, the father of his daughter for the conditions of the possibility of de developing intimacy. It's controlling the conditions for the possibility 
of the birth of intimacy between this man's daughter and some other dude. Some series of dudes. And that is what dating is. It's, it's uh, to the extent to which a father gives his daughter like a curfew if he lets her go on a date. There's still a, a, a modicum of control exercise over the condition for the possibility of the development of intimacy. I mean, this is what you're doing. It's like Mike Tyson says fire when he likens it to fear. You want to control it and let it burn uh, toward the creation of something new. You don't want to let it get out of control. And what it is, in the case of courtship and dating, is inchoate intimacy between a, a young woman and uh, the right young man. So what's happened in modern dating is just not enough superimposed control top down from the father of young women, you know, giving late curfews, uh, essentially no talking to beforehand. That's, that's, I think 80% of the problem in conjunction with a late curfew is just not telling his daughter, this is the purpose of dating colon. It's to develop enough intimacy to give, to put you in an epistemic position to make a good judgment, you know, to give you the knowledge you need to find a good young man. It is not to achieve marital or premarital, uh, premarital amounts of intimacy that ate or reduplicate perfectly the amount of intimacy you're going to experience in marriage. And if you give that talk to your kids, like, oh, this is an epistemic thing. You're chasing information when you date or, or court. And you have good kids that have been raised consistency with that end, in inconsistency with that end. And you're able to trust them, not just when they go out on a date, but any other time they go out of the house. Then I think you're going to have an, an experience. You're going to have a positive experience from dating with that with that young woman. So um, we might later talk about the age where it's appropriate to begin romantical courtship. That that's sure to create good discussion because these are utterly prudential judgments. But my point is just, when, yeah, I mean, you could what I what I plan to do. You know, my 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 eldest is fourteen, and I have six daughters. So mm -hmm. buckle up. It's to, to, to allow dating that, that, that apes courtship. I mean, unless I'm never, ever going to, like, let the daughters out of the house. Now, they haven't gone to school because we've homeschooled all of them. But uh, they're very good girls, and they're very interested in doing the right thing. I'm just going to super tightly control the conditions for the possibility of that intimacy. But it doesn't mean I'm going to, like, make them hang out in our front yard or something, which I guess would be the, the modern-day literal courtship. I was going to say, look, you have, particularly before we know this guy well, and particularly the first months, if some guy wants to court you, uh, you, you have basically 90 minutes. You're on the clock. You have 90 minutes for dinner. No, no time for dinner and a movie. That's when you get yourselves into trouble. No open-ended invitations. And also, uh, I like that. Say, look, the goal is to be courted, especially at the beginning, by multiple people at once. So you're, you're, that's consistent with that epistemic goal of information finding. But, I mean, if you, if you can't trust, I would say, if you can't trust your daughter to go out, go to dinner, tell me where you're going to be. You know, you know, you could lay down maybe the occasional reconnaissance spy mission if you're motivated as the father. But just, you know, tell me where you're going to be, uh, what place you're going to be at dinner at, and then come straight home. Because talking over a meal is appropriate. It's still enough control exercise that uh, that you could do a kind of mashup. It, for those who consider dating and courtship two totally different species, the distinction of degree spectrum, even I would admit, I'd say it would be a kind of a, a blend of them. But I would, I would term it just, you know, dating that is closer on the spectrum to courtship. Amazing. There's a lot to unpack there, Timothy. I just want to real quick go to Dr. Michael and he's uh, 
you know, you, the one of us that's not a father yet, um, and I know that you're, in a way, out there, right? And so how do you plan on going about your dating without the possibilities of falling into sin, but at the same time maintaining attraction with women out there? Because I, I know there are a lot of guys that struggle with this. I know because I've mentored many of them where they say, Elliot, I want to do the right thing. I want to be chaste. I want to court a woman. I want to vet her properly. But she's going to think that I'm... Now, they're afraid, number one, that if I don't pursue her sexually, then she's going to go somewhere where a guy's going to give her that sexual attention. And therefore, he'll lose any opportunity for being with her. Uh, or she'll think that he's somehow a uh, asexual or a, 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 there's a weak sexual drive in him. And thus, he's trying to be a quote unquote either nice guy or just a limp dick. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you date, court, maintain virtue, but at the same time build attraction? So I've been thinking about this a, a lot, and uh, for me, it, it I, I still think it's it's inseparable in the present moment from technology. I mean, you mentioned the advent of the vehicle having its impact on dating culture, and since then, that's it's just changed things even more so. So now the in the in the village, the woman's choice was between you know the the men in the town. Then when you had vehicles and you had the city, now it's the men in the city. Now, first wave internet, it's people that can, uh, you know, get online. Now, because of social media, Tinder, smartphones, Instagram, et cetera, the, the aperture of choices, both for men and women, it's blown open so wide. Everybody, it's everyone's skimming the surface and there's no depth to it anymore. So it, the key thing I keep thinking both for men and women, is how do you put a filter on that storm of surface level choices? And I think it goes back to it goes back to localism. It goes back to word of mouth and you know meeting people and having strong, thick connections in real life in the three dimensional world. And that ultimately comes back to being around your parish, right? Let the parish be your center of gravity and be the, the center of your your world. And that's pretty much what I'm trying to do. I'm really trying to live, I'm trying to like, as far as somebody that's focused so much on trying to attract women my whole life and obsessing about that, for the first time in my life, I'm trying to focus on that C.S. Lewis quote, of put first things first and you get second things as a side effect, put second things first and you lose both first and second things. So my thing that I'm really trying to do is just center my my physical life around my town and my parish and around people in the real world. And, you know, whatever, you know, whatever happens will, will be God's will. But, you know, I'm I think the getting back to these like old school ways of doing things in the physical local world is the way to prevent or to filter down this storm of choices that's ruining men and women because of modern technology. So if I understand you correctly, it sounds like you're keeping your circle of um, choice mainly around your parish, meaning you'd be finding a Catholic woman. Are you, would, what do you say to those who uh, would argue that maybe you're limiting your, your uh, pool would you date outside of your religion? No, I, I wouldn't. I think that's that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Yeah, you know, I'm, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to limit my 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 choices and, uh, you know, go for for depth and uh, commonality as opposed to breadth and superficiality. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. It sounded like exactly what you were saying, brother. So uh, Timothy brought up real quick, uh, or multiple times, but I just wanted to revisit it, the role of the father in courtship. 
I'm curious, uh, Timothy and Will, both of you guys have daughters. Timothy, you have a 14-year-old daughter, so she's reaching that age. Uh, you know, we're just teenagers. Um, what have you guys said to your children, if anything at all, thus far about uh, courtship and dating and marriage and things of this nature? I mean, every day of homeschool and every day of our life around the domus, you know, the domicile is hands-on training for these six young women to be wives and mothers, but, you know, by my wife's death to the girls. And, you know, it, we, we, we homeschool, we broke for a month from learning Latin and learning algebra and, and, uh, you know, reading, reading novels and writing, which is what homeschool is pretty much those things. But the education goes on the, 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 my wife is, is modeling your guys' vocation to the extent that you don't go become nuns, which we've, we've trained them to loosely discern from a very early age. You're not going to become a nun. Then you're going to be a wife and a mommy, presumably. And this is how you do it. You know, it's all about cooking, cleaning, baking, doing it joyfully and uh, subserving your husband. And you have to choose the best husband that you're really going to, you're going to really love every day with. You, you know, you get to choose your leader. Christianity, we've taught my daughters, and I, I used to teach my theology students, Christianity is the first worldview in human history that empowered young females to reject the preferences of her father. This sounds subversive. I'm sounding more subversive today. Yeah, usually treads, treads love me because I wrote the book on the case for patriarchy. And why my wife wrote the companion piece called Ask Your Husband. And he's in charge. But, but until the point of being married, a, a, a woman actually, even she should still remain under her father's authority. But a marriage in the Roman Catholic tradition and no other traditions before it is sacramentally invalid. Invalid if it's a shotgun wedding in the sense that the father of the bride was arranging it. But it, it's between two people together triangulated with Jesus. Three to get married, Fulton Sheen would say. It's it's one woman's decision, one man's decision with Jesus, not one woman with her father and one man. Uh, so the reason I'm bringing all this up is because it's like that, that meme on the internet where it's the guy that has to push uh, uh, one of two buttons, and both of the buttons are traditionally part of the suite of ideas associated with his worldview, with his credo. And, and trads get crossed up here sometime on the topic of how much control should the father exercise. And that's kind of what, what we're teasing out when we say how much control should you exercise when a woman starts courting? Well, it should still be quite a lot. Hey, you have an app. You have 75 minutes to go to dinner. Tell me where you're going to go. I'll time it out. You have the freedom to go. I trust my daughter enough to go or she wouldn't be dating in the first place. But you have essentially no extra time. The meal and come right back. And at any time, you know, I, I, I might come seek you out. But he should not exercise control. It should be a, a diminution. Once this couple gets more, gets intimate enough to marry, then the father's really, he is diminishing little by little. So that it, it doesn't, it's a distinction of degree uh, from the first date to the day before a given couple gets married, married in power of the father. It's not a distinction of kind where it's just, you know, at the day of the wedding, the father hands all of this, transfers all this authority over to the man because that, that's not how natural systems work. The father's authority is diminishing, not with every increasing day uh, with, with every young man that courts a woman, but with the one once they've met and they do become intimate the appropriate way, not physically, but emotionally, which is a, a, an unnatural system that we're holding kind of in abeyance. Uh, yeah, obviously, it's the man and the woman who decide we're going to get married. The, the father should not be in control of the decision or else it can't even be called a sacramental marriage. Uh, will be annullable. 
if, if there was undue influence ex, uh, exerted there. So I, I think I think there are a lot of important issues to tease out here, mm -hmm. but that's the main one. Is I, I think uh, a, a well ordered courtship centers around the diminution of the father, whereas um, now a by, lot of trans what benchmark he, does yeah. he like? At what point does he start to diminish his authority? Uh, like, is there a spectrum? Is there a, is there a checkpoint? Uh, and how long does this date, this courtship process last? Well, I mean, to the extent that let's say a young woman is courted by 10, 10 different men over the course of a couple, you know, year, year and a half or something, and then it's all going textbook. The young woman's virtuous. It's a controlled setting, but it's not over controlled. Yeah, it would. It would. I, I think it would be weird to make them hang out in your yard or something. I don't have a court, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so just you know, one pe one, one way to go. sort of uh, mitigate that um, that we practice would be, and none of my daughters are dating, but take one of your sisters with you, right? So it's like yeah, I'm not absolutely. there, and so that the way they, that way they're not alone with someone, and then they have their their sister there. Yeah, I. I mean, I like the I like the idea of hey, come, you know, I'll invite the young man after. Well, first off, so the answer is, de facto, the father begins to diminish the second that the young woman goes on even a first date or whatever you want to call it with a young man that's be, that's going to eventually capture her heart, assuming that it kind of begins at the beginning. The way this we all know how the romance works, it tends there. Once the, there's a young man in the picture who's going to go on multiple dates and maybe quarter over the course of, uh, you know, nine months or whatever, whatever uh, requisite time there is to form a chemical reaction there and get married. Um, when that young man is in the picture, automatically she's considering, by definition, you know, form is specified by intent. Uh, form gives essay, as Thomas Aquinas says. And... And uh, yeah, once she's like, wow, this guy could be the guy. Second date, this guy could really be the guy. Third date, this guy could really be the guy. And then maybe after two or three days, hey, come hang out with us and watch a family movie with us. That is where it's not awkward or weird to, for us to begin spending time with the guy, us being me and my wife. Well, if, if they've gone on two or three dates, we've met him, he's cool, um, he's a good guy. Then it's like, okay, then she's thinking about him because this is the number one rule of attraction. Uh, romantic interaction is for every one minute you spend around someone that you actually like you have chemistry with you're thinking about them for a hundred minutes and that's probably a thousand minutes in the case of young females I don't know I've never been one so the, I mean, your authority is diminishing to the extent that the young woman is like look I, I now see my path forward there's there's this young guy and this guy is my path basically out of the house not that she hates living in the house, such that by the time they're ready to get married and he asks her to get married, he is sidestepping. If he's doing things right, the bizarrely counterintuitively uh, uh, the new form of feminism that follows upon modern feminism where husbands are cuffed to their father-in-laws, which doesn't seem like it would be uh, a side product, a byproduct of feminism, but it has been. You don't want a setup where the young man is cucked to the father-in-law doing the, you know, when, once he's actually got a wife just because he's dating this man or because he's married to this man's daughter. He needs to be the sovereign. And so that's also, that's the, there's a, a downward force on dating and courtship that trads applaud. The downward forces control the conditions for the possibility of intimacy. But there needs to be an upward force as well that's as or maybe more important. It's probably more important in a long-term way. This young man and this young woman need to be developing autonomy, even as against their parents, uh, provided that, you know, you want well. The downward force is only to ensure that they don't make a mistake with virtue before marriage. That's, that's important, but it's not that important. The more life-lasting, lifelong-lasting, Forces the upward force where you're just like, okay, they need to be autonomous. Like this man should not be 
I don't want him to be cucked to me either. I want him to be a virtuous king in control of my daughter, if he's the one that she chooses. But they, he needs to not be just doing whatever he can to please me. And a lot of trads don't like when you say that. But that's truly what the patriarchy is. Hmm. I like that. It's a, it's a very good answer. Um, Will, I, I want to go to you for a moment because you've had said a lot. You've got a lot to say in terms of the ills of fornication. And, you know, you speak a lot about chastity in men. And we pointed out that, you know, fornication is a byproduct of feminism. And so we have, well, my, my question, but I'm also seeing questions in the comments here that relate to how to go about dating today and maintaining polarity with a woman. Uh, number one, if you're not having sex with her, right? And then number two, just going a little further with that, you know, guys are concerned. They're saying, how do I know if I'm going to be sexually uh, compatible with this woman and marry her if I don't get sexual with her before marriage? Uh, and guys who say, I want to try out many different women sexually to know which one would be wife material. Uh, how do we... How do we reconcile that? Well, the, the first big point to make here is that the virtue of chastity is exactly the same before marriage as after it. So if you're someone who's not practicing it before you get married, you are uh, developing a vicious habit and that's going to threaten your marriage afterwards. And you can see that in the stats. So premarital promiscuity roughly doubles the risk of divorce around that most studies show. So what I'd be suggesting to these guys is, are you cultivating the kind of habits here that you think are befitting of the father of the family that you want to be the head of? What kind of character cultivation is this? The next thing I think that's important is Aquinas's remarks about the seven daughters of lust and the first is the uh i think it's seven top of my head did the first is blindness of mind and the reason for this is that lust clouds the intellect this whole idea that you are getting to know someone better by having sex with them is the opposite of the truth if anything you're more likely to become to put it crudely pussy whipped by them and have your judgment misled because the sex is getting in the way of your assessment of their character. So what happens is you end up making poor decisions. And to put this in like theological terms, unchastity uh, destroys the supernatural life of grace in the soul. And that means that your intellect is impaired. You're estranged from God and you're stripped down just to your natural resources, which are already weakened by original sin anyway, and your will becomes more prone towards evil. You find it harder to do good. So it's really important as a man to get the strength of character, to have that strength in chastity, to actually keep your mind clear so you make a good choice rather than one which is based on you just basically falling into a thirst trap regarding being able to sexually satisfy a woman you can find plenty of studies having nothing to do with religion showing that a virgin is better able to sexually satisfy a woman than a sexually experienced man is if the woman is attracted to him so you can have as much practice as you like a decade or more of fornication sleeping with all these women trying to develop skills, then a virgin comes along that she's more attracted to and he sexually satisfies her more. So the two main reasons, I think, one, you get to know the woman better. Two, you get better at sex. The evidence doesn't show that. And so uh, going along that lines of, you know, uh, the perspective of a man going out and dating, um, you're a father, and so, you know, you kind of get to play both sides of it as well. 
when does uh, a young man then decide that, okay, I've been friends with this woman and I've been remaining chaste. Um, but it's a good, it's a good time to go and ask the father or speak with the father or uh, be engaged with the father or parents or family uh, in order to continue vetting this relationship. Uh, the two big problems with modern dating are basically that teenage boys and girls get pushed together earlier than ever and unsupervised, but simultaneously married gets pushed back later than ever. And what we want to do to combat that is to, as Tim said, exert more parental control over the dating and push the dating back so kids get a longer childhood. Like I've got a, a 16 year old daughter and I have quite tight control over all her smartphone apps and where she goes to see boys, especially not one-on-one. -on -one. You've got to watch out for that. I think Tim's right. You can have even a sibling there or a friend there that helps to neutralize some of the potential dangers. But I've also told her that when you get to 19, 20, 21, around then, when a lot of your friends might be thinking, I'm not getting married for another 10 years, that's when we need to be thinking about dating more seriously and finding men to marry. So you push the dating back, but you bring the marriage forward, which is the opposite of what most people do. And then that minimizes the chance of basically fornication, cohabitation, all those things that go to ruin marriages. Yeah, and I, I, I agree uh, perfectly with everything Will just said, not just his last answer. You push, push dating back a little bit. Uh, kids are beginning to fornicate now. I don't know if they go on dates in, in 13, 14, 15, if you look at the statistics. So push, push dating back for me. I, I don't know if I'd push it back as far as 19, but, uh, you know, 17, 18, whatever, whatever a father's comfortable with, but you push the marriage forward. So the, from, from the standpoint of the verification problem, you know, is this the, the best one for, uh, my daughter? I mean, it's not up to me. That's the point. Is this the best one for me? Which both the young woman and the young man are asking throughout courtship. It does not take even a full year. It doesn't take actually anywhere close to a year. I'm being conservative when I'm like date nine months to know. Yeah. This is not about having carnal knowledge of each other. Like Will said, that actually diminishes the extent to which a young man and woman can make a good decision. All you need to know, you know a lot of times by the fifth date. Uh, hmm. if we're being honest, but yeah, that would mm -hmm. feel like jumping the gun. The church as it becomes more liberal, it throws up more post-sexual revolution barriers to uh, marriage. The, the, the six-month waiting period is nonsense. It's a new advent that, that follows uh, the advent of feminism. And I think that there's rumor that it's to, the church is moving it in most parishes to 12 months. That's nonsense. But in this, this is where it gets really controversial, uh, really like that meme between trads picking between two buttons that would divide their ostensible loyalties. I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I certainly hope that once my daughters have decided in their heart and in their mind that this guy that, that has courted them for six or eight or 11 months or whatever it is, this is the one for me and, and vice versa. I, I certainly hope that the first person asked about marriage is my daughter, not me. And, and the reason I, I say so is because again, I don't want to set up this model whereby I'm at, at the center of their marriage. I mean, Jesus should be at the center of their marriage. And by the time that a young woman is ready to go marry, a man and be a wife and a mother at whatever, 18, 19, she, she, you know, her sovereign on earth is the young man and her sovereign in heaven remains Jesus. Of course, I'm really nowhere in the picture. So the, the, the ultimate litmus test is what does a, a, a virtuous alpha Christian male do? If he asks permission for the, I, I know this might be controversial, but if he asks permission, or the daughter's hand in marriage. Well, the Catholic Church says 
even if I say no, I don't grant it. And they go get married like uh, like a Braveheart, wedding in the woods between just the young man, the young woman, and a priest. Well, that's a that sac- sacramentally valid marriage. And um, but parents, I think trad dads who do this, who actually take seriously their ability to dispense yes or no, you, you have the indirect uh, uh, influence. You don't have the power because you can always tell your daughter, I don't, I don't like this guy at the very beginning. I'm not going to let you keep going out with him. That's what you do. That's more indirect, though. Once young people have dated six or eight or 11 months, for, provided that you didn't let her start dating too young, which most parents do, you're real, like I said, it's been a diminution with each date of your power. Uh, the church, in one of the old manuals, it used to say as much. Look, a couple should not even begin dating until they're ready. They're in the conditions for the possibility with each date of getting married. And that decision is radically between those two. Um, so even canonically, sacramentally, I'm not allowed. I mean, the marriage is invalid if I decide for her then it would be null and void. So, uh, yeah, I, I certainly hope that, uh, you know, the young man asks her first, and then they come and, and, and tell me and the wife. I, 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 because if, if I asked for my wife's death hand in marriage from her father and he said no, this proves as a litmus test that, it's, that we're not being sincere. It's not our sincere permission. We'd be like, okay, go pound right. sand. We're getting married anyway. Right. And that's, you know, you know, I was, a, I was a relatively virtuous young dude. I wasn't back in the church yet, but I was, I dated a lot and I dated mostly the right way in college. And then when I settled down with my wife, I'm like, look, I know what I'm after. Uh, I'm going to be a goodly king. And I was more of a goodly king once I came back into the faith. But I, frankly, if, it, it's a joke. And I think it's a joke that has created a LARPy imagined uh, it's like all brides wearing white nowadays. It's a fucking mm. joke, right? In in a post sexual revolution culture, asking that the father is a joke. It's a a larpy, regretful look back to an imagined past, the way we never were. That couples who fornicate do even even thirty five year old couples that have been uh, boning each other for for five years and have shacked up together. I've met young couples where the fa- the the young fornicating man asks the father. It's a fucking joke, man. It's like no, 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 no. Look, we exerted the appropriate amount of downward force. This is you guys now. It's you guys and Jesus. I'm nowhere. And I'm very close with all my daughters. I always will be. But I don't want to cuck the husband. If this is a good young man, I'm thrilled. That's all I. That's all I care about. You found a good young man. You guys did it the right way. You waited like. I, I'm dealt out of power. And that's when all of a sudden it becomes a meaningful thing for the father to give over the de dicto power. He's already had, the young man, has already had the de facto power as long as he had my daughter's heart. So yeah, I certainly hope I'm not the first one to know that they're getting married. Ask her first. Young men out there listening, <laughs> ask, ask the woman first. I'm like... Slightly surprised by your answers to a lot of these questions. Like you have this measured approach where like on one end, you know, you can be trad and conservative and write the book on patriarchy, but then just be completely realistic, I guess, uh, in terms of approaching these situations when it comes to the practical application, right? Like with your own, your own daughters. We heard from both uh, Michael and Will on this topic. Um, Given the way you've been answering the other questions, I'm curious what your take on uh, the issue that arises, and it seems to be the most important one to the young men that I speak to, which is how do I go about dating women and maintain or create attraction and polarity, uh, even display sexual dominance without falling into sexual sin, without fornicating or even getting close to it? How do we do that? in a world that just puts sex on a pedestal. Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you, Tim. No, I'm asking you. Yeah, we we heard from Michael because he's out there. We heard from Will just now, but I didn't really get a chance to ask you that same question. Well, by being, I mean, it's largely by being physically strong. By being physically strong, 
by being good at sports, and again, this is where it's it's my answer is too traditional for some traditionalists. By being good at sports, by being as big and strong as he can be, and by being interpersonally uh, a master of relations, by treating you know uh, the small man the way a Rudyard Kipling poem would say to treat treat the small man like the waiter, treat treat the sovereigns that you and my daughter uh, will deal with as you go on different dates or you, you hang out in different situations. Treat the sovereigns the way a Rudyard Kipling poem tells you to treat sovereigns. I mean, you quickly know whether or not this is a, a, a herdsman, a follower, which is not who I want my daughter dating, or a, a virtuous dude that goes his own way. There are a million different things that happen week to week to test the metal of a young man, even in this controlled environment of an, a restaurant, even if they go out once a week to the same restaurant at the same time, the way my wife and I tend to go out same time on Thursday nights, to a certain restaurant, and you don't even vary the conditions much, different stuff will happen. And a young man has every opportunity to show, not only am I virtuous, but I'm not an Ed Flanders Christian. I, I I know how to deal with whatever comes up. That's the whole point of the variegation of the experiences of dating, even if they're not much variegated. Stuff will come up. First off, is he big? Is he good at a sport? Does he know how to protect her? Uh, you, you know, we talked about fighting and stuff last time. But, yeah, it, it's just like it's, it's more important to human life, their human life together, prospectively married until death do them part, it's like dealing with the other humans. How is this guy going to deal with, hey, there, there's, there's two unruly guys at the other table, and they're looking over at my daughter and the guy that's courting her. Is there, you know, stuff like that. That's the ultimate opportunity for men to, to have their metal tested. Not by, not in the sack, like Will said. And this is, this is what ultimately will attract a young woman to a goodly young virgin. He's got to be tough, being being vicious doesn't make him more tough. Yeah, I, I tell my daughters that, especially the 16-year-old, any guy trying to push to have sex with you now, you need to immediately just pigeonhole with a big danger sign over here because he's too weak to control his lust. And if he's doing that now, if you were married to him, then he might find it very difficult to control his attraction to another woman. So he's given you a very strong signal that he can't be trusted once he gets his passions inflamed. So they know that that kind of guy, Elliot, to answer your audience member's question, is someone that we're not interested in. You want the guy who's in control of himself. So this is a, a problem or, or a situation that comes up quite often. And so... We're told that we shouldn't be jerking off, right? Masturbation is a bad idea. Don't watch porn. Uh, don't fornicate. Um, a lot of men struggle now because they're like, well, I have all this pent up sexual energy and I'm forbidden from releasing it anywhere in any which way. What do I do? And what kind of advice do you give to guys when you ask them to give all this up? Michael, I'd love to hear from you first because I know that you're, you're kind of in that, you're living that life. I was going to say, yeah, this, this particular paradox, yeah, it really hits home. I, it, bring, it brought up a memory. I can remember going to my, uh, my senior year prom, being with my date and someone saying, get together, take a photo. And of course, what, what did I do at the, at the time in my you know, very blue-pilled, reserved uh, Ned Flanders Catholic upbringing? Uh, I turned to her and I said, may, may I put my arm around you for the photo, right? So, you know, s some people might view that as like, oh, oh my gosh, oof, dude. Like, you know, could you, could you be any more asexual, any more G-rated, any more simping than doing that? Another view of that might be like, oh, you know, look, look what a gentleman he was, you know, like, look at how sexually restrained and reserved, you know, he even went to the point of asking permission to put his arm around her shoulder um, before doing that, right? So there is this like, whoever asked that, that question in your, your comment thread, there is this like, 
one foot on the gas, one foot on the brake paradox that the Christian man finds himself in, where it's like, yes, he needs to be sexually restrained, but then how does he initiate any type of sexual polarity? How does he show at all that he has uh, romantic feelings without coming off as this like asexual robot? Um, it's, you know, it's, and it's difficult. It's a, it, that it's, it's a difficult paradox to, to manage, but I think uh, let's admit that it's there. You know, I think there is, there is somewhere to that paradox that needs to be, to be, uh, crossed it, you know, these, um, we can't tell these men just, just to be asexual robots. Um, you know, they need to be able to have some capacity to communicate that they do have romantic feelings. How do you do that in a way that, that isn't, um vicious or sinful i think that's the paradox and i, I don't know how to, to to get past it but i think that that if, if I, to articulate it i think that's what it is but ultimately what needs to happen is people need to get married younger one of the mm. most like base yeah. things that aquinas says is that heroic virtue cannot be expected from ordinary men in ordinary circumstances i mean be yeah. realistic high testosterone guys early 20s with all that going through their system it's very difficult for them to avoid falling into fornication and that's why one of the reasons for marriage is fear of fornication like saint paul says let every man take his own wife for fear of fornication so it's to direct those sexual energies somewhere if you're a guy who's saying i don't want to get married till i'm 30 35 40 whatever it might be you're protracting that period of great difficulty and temptation so elliot in a nutshell the answer is these guys 20 21 they should be trying to get married so uh, yeah. certainly certainly totally agree but that but the question is let's let's bring it back let's let's focus in on that space now that that guy in his early 20 goes yeah sure i want to get married i'm attracted to this woman Catholic Church tells me I'm not allowed to show any type of romantic feeling to her. I need to relate to her like I'm her, I'm her brother, right? Like I'm just, I'm, I'm some G-rated guy. How do I begin the courtship process in a way that is still not sinful or licentious? How, how do I begin that romantic courtship in, in a way that's, that's virtuous? What does that look like? I think that's what we're trying to drill down on. So I've tried to answer my this error, question, no. and of course, you know, it's all theory because I'm not in the situation, but I would tell my men this. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but this is the advice that I've given, that you need to penetrate her, but without your penis. And so there's a way to penetrate a woman sexually with the way you talk to her, the look in your eyes, even the way you breathe. She should be able to feel your sexual strength. In a way, I, well, to be completely blunt, I say you should... Be able to talk dirty to her. Tell her that you are really attracted to her and what you would do to her, but I'm so strong that I won't. I think that you have to like get her juices flowing. You gotta warm up that that polarity uh, so that she knows like this man desires me. He's it, here, here, not just here. And I don't know if that's the right answer, but I that's just what I've offered. Like you gotta penetrate her with your energy, penetrate her with your intention, penetrate her with your look, uh, but also make it very clear that you, and just, and putting it out as a virtue, like I'm strong, like, look, you know what I could do. You know what I want to do. You know what you want to do. You know what's possible right now. But out of the, the strength of my character, I'm going to I'm going to refrain. I don't know how you say that in a way that's sexy, but it comes across as strong. What do you guys think about that? Is that is that getting too close to the line? I would I would say the the position of the church is is somewhere between these two extremes. Michael, you you thought that you can't express any romantic uh, affectation that is non-lustful and elliot you're saying you basically can can talk dirty to start the the lubricants uh, this is even a term <laughs> that, that aquinas used um, the, the the definition of uh lustful sin that aquinas gives is once the lubricants start happening <laughs> so this means that um basically 
<laughs> romantic expressions, affectations, like a goodnight kiss, holding hands, uh, a hug, stuff, stuff that this young woman has no interest in doing with her brother can be utterly, utterly licit, you know, like, a, a, you know, a goodnight kiss. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a goodnight kiss. It's just long-term necking is out of bounds because it, it gives way to, it's getting, getting both people ready to have sex. That's, that's the definition literally Aquinas gives for when sin begins. It's the, it's the KT boundary for when mortal sin begins, lust, lust, you know, one of the seven deadlies. And yeah, you can't, you're very right. You could do that uh, in the platonic sense. That's still sinful. And by adverting to the forms, Elliot, by using super graphic language, um, that, that would begin mortal sin of lust. Um, I would just say no, but, but don't, don't assume that you can't kiss, you can't hold hands, you can't uh, uh, hug or put your arm around a girl. That's, that's utterly wrong. Just you're not allowed to kiss in a way that suggests whether or not you go that far. And I, I, I didn't date this way. I, I made too many, too many errors, but, um, you, you know, you can't neck, but you're allowed to kiss according to the parameters the church gives. Hmm. Yeah, it's a tough one. And so when we're talking about courtship and, and it, with the end of marriage, what would you guys say are some of the things that are, well, let's begin with the red flags. What are some red flags that men should look out for with women uh, to cut it off immediately because she's not marriage material? I think even if she's 10 out of 10 looks, if she's giving signals that she's disobedient or disrespectful to her father or that she's really prone to anger or laziness things like that that are going to make her a poor model of virtue for your children and make her difficult for you to get along with in day-to-day -day life you need to pay very careful attention to them and don't be blinded by stunning looks thinking that they're going to make up for it because looks will fade but the beauty of virtue is more long term so prioritize that. The top three for, for me are yellow red flags are bossiness, bossiness and bossiness run. If, if a girl is mm. bossy, she usually can't get it out of her system and she'll, she'll make a very poor wife. Uh, she, she needs to be like Will said, subservient to her, her father. Hopefully she has a, a Chad father that gets all these things. And she's looking to transfer all of that uh, uh, obedient. Uh, that doesn't mean she has no personality. She should have a great personality, but she should be looking to transfer her obedience to you. If she's bossy, no second date. Hmm. What say you, Michael? Uh, the, the other thing is. Go ahead, Will. Yeah. Um. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Jump in there, Michael. I'd love to hear from both of you. Roger. Uh, advanced degrees. I think that connects up to <laughs> this point, right? I mean, you look at it statistically, you know, the, the, more, the, the more educated and the more advanced degrees that women have, the more entitled they are, the more earning power they have, the more authority and bossiness they have, and the more they um, don't, seem to like their their husbands or their boyfriends so i think that 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 connects up to the the bossiness thing. yeah yeah i was gonna say be realistic about what you can handle as a man as well you see this with things like some people shouldn't own certain dog breeds because they're too hard work they need a firmer hand and more consistency so there might be a level of bossiness that one guy is perfectly capable of disciplining and coping with in a woman, and then another guy wouldn't have a chance. So Tim's point about bossiness is, is really about what you are capable of matching as a man. Can you lead that? 
you can get a very like fiery spirited woman who can make a great wife to some men, but with other men, they wouldn't have a chance. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, this is this is something that um, we I, we've been asked a lot. My wife and I, people will say like to put not too fine a point on it. Like, wow, we read Steph's book. Ask your husband. And this doesn't this doesn't sound like the person that's appeared. She's appeared on probably ten of the episodes of Rules for Retrogrades, my podcast, and she seems witty and kind of sharp tongued. He's like, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. But and, and I, I told the story of our courtship and how it began. You know, we were each dating other people. We just became great friends. And I've seen her with another boyfriend that she did not respect, and and it. It was bad. So Will's point is absolutely true. We're dealing with, we're not dealing with an on-off switch, bossiness on, bossiness off. It's a continuum. And women that are more spirited, that's a good term, Will, have bigger personalities, will incline, even if they're not disordered much, they'll incline towards seeming bossy. But if they respect a good young dude, which has nothing to do with them being sexually active, has to do with, is this a, a young chat uh then and she really likes him she'll she'll do what he says and he'll know how to play he'll know how to cultivate the relations as they're courting even if you know she has she has a spirited will but we get we get asked this all the time because um steph's steph's a wisecracker and she she sounds pretty pretty sharp at times when she criticizes things and she is but uh and i and i saw her in a relationship where she did not respect the other man, you know, while I was dating a, around a lot, coming up in Dallas, and um, yeah, she she is a very respectful wife because of the the fact that within bounds, a lot of this stuff is relative. But there's I'm giving you the macroscopic view. Will say the microscopic view is zoom in on this, and there's actually natural disparities within that range of appropriateness of non-bossiness, bossiness, were kind of the proof. Right. Yep. Ta the Taming of the Shrew, Shakespeare's great play, is one of the most politically incorrect ones, least taught in schools, and it's about this. So Petruchio is able to do what no other man can, which is tame Kate. And he wants this as the challenge, almost to prove his dominant to the other guys. Like, oh, you think no one can tame her? No one can manage her as a wife. Well, watch this. And then he does it and she likes it. So that's why the feminists hate that play so much. And I'd recommend guys just go and look at the dynamic between those two characters throughout that. That's great. Well, you know what the feminists will hate even more than the taming of the shrew is your, your analogy two comments ago to uh, uh, the disparity of ownership over different dog breeds. <laughs> That was good. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. Sorry. Yeah. So I got a question here from one of our uh, comments. Aubrey Earl asks, he says, how can one prepare to be a good husband and leader in the home? Well, isn't it the other four of the Sorry, seven sacraments? Ahead. Four of the seven act, uh, sacraments give like enlightenment to the intellect. So a man who's living a, a life in full communion, taking the sacraments and is submitting himself to God is going to get the assistance that he needs to be a good leader. People mm. forget that patriarchy depends first of all on men following God. If you try to do this all by your own power or try to be a good father just on your own power alone, you're not going to do a good job of it. Perfect answer. I, I, I don't have much, much more to give. It's Plato wanted there to be a unity of the virtues. One super virtue you could get to get you all the other ones. Aristotle scoffed at this. There is no super virtue. You got to get them one at a time. And a good patriarch is just going to be one that's habituated each of the natural virtues in conjunction with those supernatural virtues that, that uh, flow from the sacraments. So Will, Will's answer is perfect. Nice. Michael, what are you doing to prepare? I'm sure it's along the same lines, brother. 
same general uh, general idea as reading Tim's book, trying to uh, habituate and embody these these virtues. And as Tim writes about, he says, "Yeah, leadership is the it's the lodestar of patriarchy, and it, it it's the culmination of all these virtues. So to be a leader really requires." Taking, taking the cardinal virtues of prudence, temperance, fortitude, justice, embodying them, and then, then being just being that person day in and day out with as many habits that, uh, that one can, can build upon just little by little. Here's a question that I thought of. Uh, so what are some good dates to go on uh, if you're going to be doing biblical courtship? What are some good places to, I guess two questions, to meet women of this nature. I guess we spoke about that with regard to church, but with the parish, Michael said that. But okay, so let me stick with my original question. What are some good dates? Where are some good places we could take a young lady in order to get to know her better in a virtuous way? Dinner is always the best place for conversation. I mean, you could, you could go to coffee, but this is just kind of a cucked postmodern, postsexual revolution. <laughs> Way to get to know someone, but it is it is fun and coffee enlivens the mind because of the caffeine. Should a man say, pay for the dinner? Yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm not, I'm not that much of a subversive. I mean, this is this is why if you read Case for Patriarchy, you'll see you're always going to see in every page that downward force I described. You want to con control the conditions for the possibility of intimate being springing up. But uh, the upward force as well, which is probably more important for the whole life of two young people. Remember that point that I made earlier, folks. The young man has got to become the sovereign. You don't want him aping the woman's father the whole life. That's a bizarre new form of larky throwback, uh, regretful feminism. And, um, you know, the man, young man always taking the young woman to dinner is the best model for it. you enjoy yourself. You get to know each other. You women don't like to eat a lot on a first, second, or third date. But, um, you know, by the time you're actually comfortable with each other, a weekly or, you know, bi-monthly date uh, at, a, at a good dinner place is really fun and enlivening. And you can have coffee afterwards, whatever whatever the time allotment is. I would just add this condition, though, Michael. I, you know, I'm, I'm huge on subsidiarity. That's the number one political principle. And that's what really Catholic Republic is all, all about. Um, localism, but I would also say that uh, another truly non-LARPy but truly traditional way to meet people apes the arranged marriage and is through setups. Setups are, I think, a better way to meet people in than the parish life uh, in, in our day because the parish life is so messed up. When I was dating a lot in college, I tried some Catholic youth group stuff, even though I wasn't even going to church every week. I was like, oh, this should be a good place to meet cool young chicks. And just Catholicism right now culturally is so messed up, you know, after the, you know, the, the new mass and the, the liberality that entered our church 100 years ago, then formally 50, 60 years ago, and now with Francis, it really wasn't any better. It was a weird mixture of worldliness and nerdiness that we're looking for the the middle way, the golden mean. And um, the best way is really setups, not, not hardcore like Hindu type setups. But if, if there are two couples that are really Catholic and one of them has a young boy and the other has a young girl, I mean, it's, it's good to throw them together uh, later in life. Uh, you know, once, once they're teens, uh, let, let them see and to really talk up the other uh, uh, party's kid. Um, or just setups from Catholic, good Catholics, you know, is is the best thing because these people have. If you trust the judgment of someone, whether it's your parents, in a way where they're they're setting you up with a girl and you still maintain the control, or the girl still maintains the ultimate decision to, to keep, prevent it from being like a Hindu arranged marriage, or you just trust your friend's judgment, this you could consider the other party pre vetted. I, I'd say this is the most effective way. It does, in essence what the search conditions of a what the search conditions of like a, a computer dating Christian match Christian meet 
site does. You know, if you trust person A and they say go mm -hmm. go with person B, this is going to be the best. The best way to feel like you know a young woman uh, without actually knowing her. So it, it's an an accurate way of aping intimacy. What are your thoughts on this? So I've considered this in the past, like something like a courtship ball, right? Like, so this is what wealthy people do. They will bring other families around that have children about the same age as their children and put on events with the sole purpose of getting the children to know one another. Like, for example, Will and Timothy, you got our kids are not very different in age, like bringing our kids together and then maybe inviting 10 other couples that have kids around our age and bringing them together with the sole purpose like of it being a courtship ball. Like, hey, we're bringing you around other families with same with similar values with the intention of getting to know each other for potential uh, mates. What are you guys thought, thoughts on that? Maybe that's something we should set up. I, I yeah, think that's a brilliant idea, Elliot. Supervised. I, uh, Yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea, Elliot. I, I actually went to something like that when I was 19, when I was a cadet at West Point. It was a, it was a debutante cotillion uh, in Washington, D.C., where it was it was really a, a group of like wealthy, old money, aristocratic families that were bringing their daughters to to debut into society. And they, they flooded the um, the ballroom with, you know, cadets from the Navy and uh, the army and the other academies. And, and I, you know, I, I couldn't make sense of sort of what it was at the time, you know, so I was sort of clueless, but it really felt proper. And it felt like I was traveling back in time to some, to some bygone era of like, Oh, this is, you know, like pride and prejudice type, uh, aristocratic dating. And I look back on that. I, I kick myself for not realizing what, what, a um, a proper opportunity that was to date and to court in the ways that we're talking about right now. So it's like, yeah, like why couldn't you bring that back, especially on a small scale? I don't see what, you know, it doesn't need to be that, that big and opulent, but yeah, sure. I think that's a great idea. I've got to go in a minute, guys. I've got a lesson coming up, but I just want to take Michael's point there and really stress it because if parents put half the effort into those kind of more formal social situations where they could supervise kids getting to know each other, if they put half the effort into that, that they do into organized sports, we've been a much better place. Mm. There's been a real abdication of authority, like Tim said, with the father's role in particular, and the priorities are wrong. But I've enjoyed talking to you guys today. I'm looking forward to next session as well. Awesome. Thanks, Will. And so uh, let's wrap up anyway. Uh, any parting words, uh, Will, before you bounce? And then we'll just go around the horn. Uh, push dating back, bring marriage forward. That's the way to solve the main crisis regarding dating and courtship in the West. Dating back, marriage forward. Awesome. Will, Will Nolan, go check him out on YouTube, Substack, and follow his stuff. Awesome. Thanks, dude. What about you, Tim? Thanks, guys. Peace, Will. I would, I, I mean, Will and I tend to be pretty tete-a-tete. Uh, um, -tete, but you know, I, I love pretty much everything he said today. <laughs> he's, he's right uh, in lockstep with what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Push, push dating as far back as a parent is comfortable with the age of, you know, imagine if that young dater, whatever age the daughter is, says she wants to marry a guy in four or six months. I mean, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. That's the telos of dating. So don't be shocked if your daughter's out, you know, like a debutante uh, calls it, you know, in reference to Michael's story. She's out and then she says, oh, I, I want to get married. You right. should not be dating. You're not ready to get married. So I don't know, whatever that is, 17, 18, 19, Get, get married young. Yeah. Um, to those people who did not marry young and are still looking around, 30, 40, whatever, uh, means of, of Christian virtuous efficiency are your best 
uh, that. And, and it's not, it's not too late. Folks don't see it as too late if this hasn't happened because there's, there's, uh, now Michael and I were talking about this the other day. There's 3.9 billion women in the world. Some significant fraction of those are still of dating age. And there are virtuous women out there. They're just hard to find. I guess I'm talking to your audience, which is young men now specifically, Elliot. They're hard to find, not impossible to find. Even if there was one woman on earth who is uh, worthy of marriage, and there are more, it just doesn't seem like it. But she'd be worth seeking out. So, um, again, the, the best way of doing so is at the parish life and through, I would say, setups. Mm, amazing. Uh, parting words, Dr. Michael. So I would say even though we are relating right now via modern technology and our audience is relating to us through modern technology, I would say... You know, work on putting the smartphone away and going out into the real world, into the three-dimensional world and meeting people in real life, you know, in your parish, in your local town and uh, have, and fostering old school communication, not, not this technologically mediated nonsense. And uh, I think that's, that's the way to get back to being, being human. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us here today, guys. And uh, next week we'll be on whose whose show will we be on? Whose channel? Doctor Michael, go follow. I'll uh, be my channel. Mike. I was uh, I was yep. blessed to be interviewed by Doctor Michael on his channel. What is your channel? So they can go check that out and join us next week. Right. So it's uh, the Patriot Philosopher podcast or Michael Robillard on uh, YouTube and Substack and Twitter. Awesome. Very cool. And Timothy. Let us know where we can follow you so that when we get together for your show, uh, our fans can be there. Just look up Timothy Gordon on YouTube or, or my show is called Rules for Retrogrades. You can also check me out at timothygordon.com. Also, I just point out that the YouTube gods have deigned to uh, identify Will as a woman. <laughs> so you see the silhouette there is a female. Oh, I got rid of it. Give it. Let's see. <laughs> oh, he's a guy now. Oh, he's a dude now. Well, yeah, that was. Uh, I, I prefer. That's ecam live. <laughs> Very cool. Well, that's it. That's all. Thanks for joining us, folks. Until next time, stay strong. Done. Thank you.